Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's kind of a nice opportunity to uh, represent my job talk without having to be stressed out about getting a job. So that's, that's nice. Uh, so as Ian said, uh, today I'm going to talk about traffic flow management, which is a process that the FAA uses to kind of ensure safe operations of flights in the national air transportation system, specifically focusing on equity efficiency and then talking a little bit about passenger impacts. So some data on the airline industry. Um, in 2007, which was kind of the last peak year before the economic recession, uh, there were 689 million U.S. air travelers domestically. Uh, the airline industry in that year is estimated to contribute about $640 billion in impact to the U.S. economy, either directly um, through ticket sales and, and employees and, and also indirectly to the industries that it supports. Uh, there is a relatively significant environmental impact to air transportation. Uh, domestic uh, commercial air travel is estimated to have produced about 114 million metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, which is only about a percent and a half of the total emissions for U.S., but still, but still significant. Um, and perhaps the most important thing to remember about the airline industry is that in 2007 there were $5 billion in profits, but that was immediately followed by losses of $9.5 uh, billion for 2008. And more importantly, in the nine-year period from 2000 to 2008, the industry had $60 billion in losses. So this is, a, um, this is an industry that has lots of problems. Uh, and, um, and, and fortunately, lots of problems that operations research, game theory, the types of, of, of work that we do can really contribute to. Just to give you a, kind of an image of the air transportation system, on, the, on my right uh, are the, some of the major airports. Um, Fly.faa.gov, if you're ever kind of on the day of travel and you want to see how the airports are performing, this is happened to pick uh, one of the rare days where everything was operating smoothly. But uh, if you go there normally, you'll see a lot of red and orange dots for airports where there are lots of delays. Um, and then also we have the air sectors. So the, the airspace uh, above the US is, is split up into these small sectors uh, that are controlled by individual air traffic controllers. And those air sectors have capacities much like the airports based off of workload, but also based off of uh, air plane separation requirements in route. So this is just kind of a fun video that I wanted to show if it works. We'll see. It worked when I tested it yesterday. There we go. Uh, so this is, this is a simulation created by NASA. The, they have their FACET tool. And here we have a simulation of the air traffic in the US. Uh, in the right-hand corner is the, the UTC time and the number of planes in the air. So right now, we're kind of hitting overnight travel. Uh, as you can see, there's still a lot of planes, uh, a lot of flight, uh, freight travel overnight. But uh, overnight, the system is significantly underutilized. So from a, from a traffic flow perspective, we can always push flights later in the day and create enough capacity. But then as it starts to get into the morning, uh, you'll see the East Coast start to fill up. And then gradually, it starts to spread rest, west. Um, one of the things that is somewhat apparent in this, in this picture as the number of flights goes up is that the most significant source of congestion in our system is the Northeast Corridor. Uh, it's the most significant number of passengers, and it's also the largest airports. And uh, so that's it's kind of a, a visual representation. Now, the costs associated with this congestion, there's been a lot of studies to try to estimate what the, what the costs are. What are, what are we dealing with um, here? And so the first two numbers here, I have the cost of the US carriers of 20 billion and the cost of US passengers of 18 billion based on delays as a result of congestion. Uh, those two numbers are based off of a Nextdoor uh, report, which is, I believe, the National Centers for Excellence in Aviation Operations Research. I don't know how that gets to Nextdoor, but uh, trust me, I guess. Uh, and then the cost of the US economy is based off of uh, the Congress Joint Economic Committee's analysis. So, so we're looking at, at $50 billion in costs associated with congestion and delays. And remember, backing up to uh, a couple slides ago, this is an industry that is operating every year on you know, up profits of up to $5 billion and losses of up to $10 billion. So the, these, 
these magnitudes of this impact is, is, rel is very significant. And, and more importantly, uh, this is projected to grow. The, the uh, growth of air transportation demand, as opposed to tracking population growth, tends to track uh, growth in US gross domestic product. And so as our economy recovers, we very quickly expect to hit those 2007 levels again and exceed them. And so there's work being done in next generation air traffic, uh, air traffic management uh, to, to improve the system, to increase capacity, but, but there's still a lot more to be done. So what are the different kind of approaches that, that are used today? Well, outside of the US, a big, uh, a very important approach is demand management, using market techniques or, or um, sort of strategic controls to control the number of flights that can be scheduled. Uh, in the US, there is none of this. So there are airports right now where more flights are scheduled, more operations are scheduled than the clear weather capacity. And so uh, you just know that there's going to be delays. But uh, the incentives are not there for any single airline to reduce that. And so, so there's a lot of work around, um, there has been a lot of work around congestion pricing or slot auctions to try to resolve this problem. But so far, uh, those run into very significant political hurdles. Traffic flow management is primarily what I'm going to be talking about today. And again, as I said, these are approaches that can try to control the flow of aircraft through the system. So if we think there's going to be imbalances between capacity and demand, such as due to a severe storm, how do we adjust the schedule uh, to compensate for that? And then we always have this sort of last line of defense, which is air traffic control. We have the controllers who are sitting in the towers uh, making sure that uh, no two planes ever get too close to each other en route, or that two planes try to land at the same time, um, or hopefully that planes don't overshoot their airport by 100 miles, but sometimes that uh, doesn't um, happen. Uh, but primarily, the, what they use to do that is they, they'll change the, the speed of the flights. Uh, they'll try to reroute the flights. They call that vectoring, because everything flies sort of point to point en route. Uh, or they'll hold airborne uh, holding, queuing, at the arrival airport. So as I said, again, we're going to focus on traffic flow management. Um, so what do we do? Well, so in this talk, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, is we're going to develop some computational heuristics, or rather in my thesis, what I've done is we've developed some computational heuristics to make these optimization-based approaches to this problem tractable. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is improving the utilization of these airports and air sectors, the, those controlled resources that I showed early on. Uh, and, and demonstrate that the, the ad hoc approaches or heuristics that are utilized in practice lead to inefficiencies. Uh, an important issue that is not addressed often in the research is the fact that the system is not just flights. We also have passengers traveling on these flights. And those passengers have connections that they have to make. And so quantifying the impacts of passengers also gives us another lever to play with in terms of improving the system efficiency. And so we'll talk about how we can do that, quant how we can do that quantification. And the last thing that's kind of ongoing work is tying this all together to coordinate actions between the FAA and airlines, to take this multi-tiered system and use it to allow us to kind of improve efficiency at each of those levels. So uh, as I kind of mentioned, we'll f focus on the kind of the second and the third bullet, mostly in the talk today, though I will tie it together a little bit with some talk of the work that's, that's ongoing. Um, just an outline. Give you some background on traffic flow management, a little more details about how this is implemented in practice, and what's been done in the literature, what, what's the work that I'm building on, uh, what are the specific contributions that, that we've sort of added to this, um, coordinating these programs, looking at passengers, and connecting the pieces, and then, um, and then I'll, I may talk about future research directions, if time allows. Uh, in practice, as I said, traffic flow management uh, are, are, they're implemented on the day of operation. So if, if at 7 in the morning, uh, the, control, the, the FAA comes in, and it looks like there's going to be severe weather uh, around the New York airports, and therefore that the number of scheduled operations is going to significantly exceed the capacity, they'll put these programs in place. They use ground delay programs to control the arrival rate into airports, and airspace flow programs to control the arrival rate through, this, through the airspace, through these air sectors. The approach they use to manage these programs is just ration by schedule. It's first scheduled, first served. So if, a, if an airport had a number of flights scheduled 
in an hour and it was full capacity and then the capacity got cut in half, they just expand that schedule to two hours and extend everything out. Now that's always feasible because kind of as we showed in that video, overnight capacities are significantly underutilized. So the FAA will never itself cancel flights. They'll just continue to extend the schedule and eventually due to operational concerns, the airlines will be forced to cancel flights. But the FAA won't cancel flights themselves. Um, the, the reason this has become very accepted within the industry as fair is because all flights are sort of treated equally, right? It doesn't matter whether it's one airline or another. In fact, it's completely agnostic to the airline that, uh, that owns the flight, and it also doesn't care about size. Yep. Um, so... Okay, so, so my, my answer to that would be, um, yes, there are a lot of people that, that travel for, for leisure purposes, but uh, they're not who the airlines make money off of. So a lot of the scheduling approaches that are in place are to try to capture as many business travelers as possible. Um, and business travelers are especially sensitive to the schedule. Um, so when you look at sort of the competitive curves, it's always better to add more flights, even if that increases congestion, because there is um, a nonlinear relationship between frequency and market share. That's kind of an S-curve. So as you increase your frequency, you get a larger percentage of the market share, even though that may lead to costs through the system. So they're not, they're not appropriately internalizing uh, the costs of delays, which is why a lot of people have looked at these market mechanisms, because that's, right, that's, you know, if we want to think about a, an ideal way to internalize those costs, that's um, uh, that'd be appropriate. But so far, there's been political hurdles. And so one of the things that, that I'm not going to talk about today, but I'm looking at is how do you extend traffic flow management to try to make it so it incorporates some of those costs? Oops, that's not a good idea. Can we, is that, can you read it? No. All right, we'll put that back over here. Um, another important part of this traffic flow management process, as I said, the FAA doesn't really control the flights. The airlines control the flights. And so the FAA is just allocating capacity to the airlines uh, through this ration by schedule approach. Now, the airlines are free to respond to that however they wish. And in particular, they can swap their flights arriving into a controlled airport, or they can cancel individual flights. Um, and so this first stage allocation is then directly impacted by these airline procedures. Uh, and and you know, if you think about it, that maintains feasibility because I'm giving a set of slots to an airline and now saying to the airline, do whatever you want with those slots and then come back to me. Uh, those operations that the airline performs can leave gaps in the schedule. And so then the FAA compresses the schedule to fill in those gaps. And it does this compression in a way that provides an incentive for airlines to give information about canceling flights. There's an important information sharing problem that this has addressed where previously airlines had no incentive to provide cancellation information because uh, they might have some chance of using that in the future. Question? I think that with this policy, if I, if I were an airline, I would schedule many, many, many very small flights or even bogus flights mm -hmm. just, to get, just to get the slots for the ATK and just tell the rest. Yeah. Can the airline do that? Uh, I think they do. I mean, I, I think they do, but you got to remember that. So, traffic flow management programs aren't all the time. So that's part of it. So they still have to, you know, the primary prim, primary driver of how airlines create their schedule is sort of the expected cost, right? And if you're flying more small planes, they're less fuel efficient. So the fuel costs associated with that are larger. You need more crew. You need more pilots. Um, they, I think. The, the fact that they're flying more and more small planes is more driven by this competitive aspect rather than this incentive that's in place uh, with, uh, with traffic flow management programs. But you're correct. There is a, a perverse incentive f created through these, through these programs for airlines to actually schedule more flights as opposed to less because it gives them more flexibility uh, in the result. But they do pay for their slots in the original schedule? No. 
No, they pay land. So, so this, is, this is actually one of the reasons why the system is so messed up is because they pay landing fees. So an airline pays to land at an airport, and the landing fee is proportional to the weight of the aircraft. So larger planes actually pay more than smaller planes. And if you think about from a system perspective, you want to incentivize airlines to fly larger planes because it creates more capacity in the system, whereas right now we're actually doing quite the opposite. So we have a lot of places where there are these small incentives that add up potentially to, you know, with the bigger issue of the competitive nature, uh, that add up to there's just a lot of small planes in our system. And then we repeat uh, steps two and three as needed, and eventually we come to some solution that everybody's happy with, and, and then we operate based on that. And then, of course, that solution gets completely thrown out the window because there's uncertainty and the weather changes and air traffic controllers mess with it. But this is, the, this is kind of the process uh, by which these traffic flow management programs, it's all assumed to be deterministic, and we manage it through this process. Uh, in the literature, a lot of people have looked at a, a coordinated nationwide approach. And what I mean by that is that kind of those two pictures that I show with the airports and air sectors, uh, we're going to constrain all of them. So we're going to put capacity constraints even at their nominal capacity levels and create a schedule that satisfies all of those constraints. Right? It's a large scale uh, integer programming problem and all flights are controlled. Uh, it's, been, it's been very popular within the academic community, uh, particularly I think starting in 1994, Bert Seamus and Stock Patterson showed that this formulation for this problem, the connectivity constraints that, that one flight has to follow another or one air sector has to follow another, uh, can be represented in a facet defining way, which, uh, which means that, that the, the linear relaxation is closer to the convex hull of, of the integer solution. So you, you get a, a much quicker uh, solution to the integer programming problem. And, uh, uh, so there's been a lot of work on that, particularly computational work um, but some, some issues with that approach. Now, one, computational performance is still an issue because if you saw kind of that first picture I drew of all the air sectors, we're talking about hundreds of air sectors, right, 30,000 flights a day on the order of 50 to 100 airports. And so the number of constraints and variables grows very quickly, millions of variables, uh, um, hundreds of thousands of constraints depending on the, how you discretize time. Um, so we still, in a, in a practical setting where we want to be able to run this very quickly, uh, that, that becomes a, an issue. Fairness among flights, as I said, rationed by schedule, this, this concept of first scheduled, first served, is very um, set within the airline industry. They, they are very comfortable with it. And when you just throw everything into a scheduling model, there's no guarantees that it will be at all close to first scheduled, first served. And so how do we do that in a network setting is an interesting question, something that I'm going to talk a lot about. And then also this collaboration, this fact that the FAA is not really a centralized controller but is more of a mediator. How do you incorporate that into a model where you're now scheduling every single resource in the system? It makes it much more difficult to think about how an airline could even adjust the schedule that's given to them. Right? How, would they, how would they swap two flights? Um, so in practice, what, uh, what happens now is because of these controls on the airspace and the airports, a single flight can be impacted both in route and on arrival. And since the capacity allocations are performed independently, each of those ration by schedule allocations gives that flight potentially a different controlled time of departure. Right? We're taking the slot that's allocated either for the controlled airspace or the controlled airport, and we're saying to that flight, you have to wait to depart a certain amount of time in order to get through in the slot that you've been assigned. Now, if those slots are incompatible, then we have a conflict. And so, in practice, they use two approaches. The first is very simple. I'll call it exemption RBS. But the first is just whatever, whatever program is implemented first, the flight keeps that controlled time of departure, no matter what's implemented in the future. So the flight's exempted from future programs. Uh, the second is precedence RBS, and that's kind of the default behavior. And in that, ground delay programs take precedence because um, they were there first. 
I mean, practically speaking, it's sort of ad hoc, and that's, that's the rationale behind it, is that ground delay programs have much longer history, uh, whereas airspace flow programs were not implemented until 2007. I think ground delay programs were started in uh, 1981. Um, so it's typically exemption unless a flight is impacted first by an airspace flow program and then a ground delay program, in which case you just use the ground delay programs one. And so we'll talk about what that means kind of through an example. So precedence RBS, just to go through a scheduling example, so let's, let's assume we have four flights, A, B, C, and D. They're scheduled to depart at the times listed, 5.45, 5.15, 6, and 6.15. Uh, and they're scheduled to arrive uh, through this flow-controlled airspace, FCA1, which is this um, polyhedron, and then uh, into LaGuardia, an airport. Right? And A, A flies directly to LaGuardia, B flies through the airspace into LaGuardia, C, just, C and D just fly through the airspace. So now if we reduce the capacity to one arrival every five minutes for the air sector, we get as follows, right? We just sort of expand it out, as I said. So now the controlled time of departures for B, C, and D are 5, 15, 6, and flight D got delayed four minutes to 6, 19. But if we also reduce the capacity for LaGuardia subsequently, then flight A gets to arrive on time, but flight B would be delayed by nine minutes. And now it has a conflicting control, right? So this is what I was talking about in terms of the conflicts. And so we'll just choose to use the one based off of the airport and say, you don't get to depart until 524. That's this precedence approach that they use. Right? They just pick one. And it results in a total of 13 minutes of delay. So what are the problems with that? Well, the first obvious problem is we originally said we wanted one arrival every five minutes, and now we've, you know, in this, in this 645 to 649 discrete interval, we have two. Um, to some extent, that's... This is actually the, the smallest issue because airspace capacity, as I said, is partially based off separation requirements. It's also partially based off of workload considerations. And so it's much more subjective than airport arrival capacity. And so violating that, as long as it's small violations, is reasonable knowing that we always have this last line of defense with air traffic control. Um, exe and exemption RBS, the other heuristic, which I'm not going to give the example of, doesn't have this property typically because it's exempted, so it reduces the capacity of the subsequent program. The, the bigger issue is that we can have inefficient resource utilization, which should not be surprising because once we have this conflicting scheduling problem, we, we're now into a, sort of an NP-hard regime, and so clearly this sort of linear heuristic is not going to give us something that is optimal. Uh, and as I said, if, if we're really considering fairness, then and we want to be consistent with the original ordering, we've now violated that ordering for the, air, for the airspace. Right? This, this seems reasonable because LaGuardia is, is, is in some sense more congested. It had one every 10 minutes. But you could very easily think the other way around where LaGuardia is less congested and the flight gets to skirt all of the congestion from the, from the airspace based off of that. So this could be a significant uh, fairness issue as well. And how can, we, how can we do better? Well, if we just swap A and B into LaGuardia, which is not possible under the approach that's, that's currently being used, it allows B to utilize its scheduled departure time, and we're going to say that flight D can move up into this recently vacated slot. Right? We're going to continue to allow the optimization-based approach to exceed the capacity in the same way that the current approaches do for kind of an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. And this results in 10 minutes of delay. So we've reduced delay from 13 to 10 minutes. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to build an optimization model to capitalize on. So what is the opportunity? Um, well, uh, here's just taking from a, I'm taking just this number, this annual cost for US economy. This is based off of just delays to schedule, and it's from the Congress Joint Economic Committee report, so it's a single source. Uh, we estimate that about 30% of the delays are due to traffic flow management. Uh, and 13% are on these days where we have conflicts. So in essence, the, the cost of this, the baseline, is, is about a billion dollars, which in the system is relatively small. And we're talking about, you know, 1% delay reduction is about $10, $10 million in annual cost savings. But what we'll show is that uh, we can get these cost savings without disrupting uh, th there's not an integration component. There's not an integration cost to it. It's very easy to swap in this new type of approach and get these savings back out. So the contributions um, 
for, as far as coordinating t traffic flow management programs, as I said, this first scheduled, first served notion of fairness is important. And so that's subjective. Uh, that's a subjective notion when you think about it in a network context. How do you even how do you measure it? And so the first thing we need to do is we need to make it objective. Right? We need a measurement to say how far does the schedule deviate from first schedule, first serve. Uh, it's, it's related to this concept that's been developed by Voss and Hoffman and Wamsgond. Uh, and we're going to use that metric to show that the two models that we propose for coordinating these programs have a nice trade-off between efficiency as measured by system delay, schedule delay, and fairness as measured by this equity metric that we develop. And we'll evaluate these relative to the current approach and show that there are efficiency, opportunities for efficiency improvements. So the, so the metric we developed is called time order deviation. It's, it's best uh, explained through an example. So let's say we have a, a single flight that is scheduled to fly through two controlled uh, two airspace flow programs, FCA1 and FCA2, en route to LaGuardia at the, at the times listed. And let's say someone independently gives us a schedule where, uh, where we know the order of flights arriving through FCA1, FCA2, and LaGuardia in this controlled schedule. We don't know which one of these is, is the, the flight that we care about, but we know the order. And we also know that originally this flight was supposed to be second was supposed to be fourth, was supposed to be third. And so if we, if we strictly uh, constrain to be in the same order, then we'd expect that this flight would get the highlighted arrival slots. Make sense? But if you look at the delay associated with them, they're inconsistent. Right? The, the arrival slot into FCA1 corresponds to 10 minutes of delay into FCA2, 7.15, minus 7 o'clock is 15 minutes of delay, and into LaGuardia, 7.20 minus 7.15 would be 5 minutes of delay. So, so, so it couldn't get all of these slots. Even though, from an ordering perspective, we expect it, th th this is incompatible. Well, the key with, with the metric we developed is it shouldn't expect to get any less than the maximum of these. Right? Each one of these expected delay values sort of measures the congestion along each of these resources in the controlled schedule. And so if instead the flight were given 25 minutes of delay, then we would say the deviation from the time order deviation is the 25 minutes of delay minus the 15 minutes maximum expected delay. So 10 minutes of unfair delay was assigned to this flight. Or 40% of the flight's delay was unfair. And we're going to use this metric to compare scheduling approaches. Uh, the official def definition. Um, don't have to get too much into the math, but the important thing to note here is that uh, it's, it's not, if we're trying to minimize time order deviation because that's the amount of unfair delay, then it's, it's not a convex objective because we have subtracting the expected delay, which is a max. Right? So minus a max, essentially a min of a min. So we have a non-convex. So we can't directly represent this in a linear optimization problem. And so, uh, so, so anytime that's the case, what do we do? Well, first we try to convexify it, right? We, we come up with a convex approximation of this metric and use that uh, as objective in our optimization model. And then the second thing, the thing that we're particularly excited about is stepping away from the metric entirely if we just adjust the form of the objective function in this, originally schedule, in this original scheduling model we get back a solution that matches very closely to this convex approximation without any of the computational limitations. Um, so the, the key with the, with the convex approximation is as follows. So this is exactly as we were saying before, but here we have Rf max of f. And so instead of taking all of the controlled resources along the flight's route, we only take the controlled resources along the flight's route that a priori, before we've done any scheduling, we say would maximize the ration by schedule delay. If we just strictly extend it right, and ignore network congestion entirely, what would be the resources that we expect to be the most congested? And then we're going to take the average over that as opposed to the max. So by replacing the max with an average, we've now made this something that we can minimize. 
directly. Um, and uh, so some comments on it. As I said, the, because we're looking, because we're predicting, we're, we're guessing, we're guessing which resources are going to be the worst based off of ration by schedule. Ration by schedule only picks up the imbalances due to capacity and demand. It doesn't pick up any of the network congestion effects. So this is a good approximation if those network congestion effects are small. If those network congestion effects are particularly large, it's a bad approximation. Uh, but it turns out that in practice, there is very limited network interaction between these programs, and so this approximation does end up being quite good. Uh, but tractability is a huge issue. Keeping track, uh, modeling this approximation requires us to keep track of the schedule both from the flight's perspective as well as the resources perspective. Because I need to know what time the flight arrives, but also what time the third flight arrives into each resource. So now we need two parallel views of the schedule uh, and binding constraints to tie them together. And those binding constraints um, lead to non-integral solutions. So we get a much larger amount of branch and bound uh, in this problem. But it does give us an approximation of the efficient frontier for some of our smaller problems. And we'll use that as a way to demonstrate that the second approach is, um, is a, good, sort of a good next step. So the exponential penalty model, so let's say we, again, using this concept of for each flight, what is the maximum amount of delay it would be assigned if we perform ration by schedule independently for each resource around its, along its route? Right? If, we, if we just thought that there was going to be congestion due to capacity demand imbalances and not due to network interactions, what would that look like? Well, we know it's not going to be exactly that, but what we can do is beyond that interval, for each flight, we can start to penalize it by a slightly more and more increasing amount, an exponentially increasing amount. So if we look at this chart, right, the green line, if we just did a linear delay cost, as is often represented in the nationwide model, uh, it would look like this. But if we allow this exponential penalty, then in every interval, we increase the rate at which the delay costs go up. And so this is going to encourage the optimization approach to push the solutions towards this threshold value as much as possible. Um, so the comments on it. Well, the one thing that's nice is this exponential base, how quickly that curve grows, controls the trade-off between fairness and delay. We have an implicit control because the faster that grows, the more it's going to push the solution towards that threshold value. Um, and not only that, it appears to, for, for some complex examples, improve the performance of the base model. We maintain all of the nice structural properties from that bert stock patterson formulation that I talked about. Uh, and this exponential penalty breaks symmetry between schedules under a linear objective. If you think of two flights going to the same airport, under a linear objective, I can swap them, and it's going to be the same objective value. Whereas under an exponential penalty approach, whichever one was scheduled to arrive first, it's going to be much more beneficial to actually have it arrive first. So how do we do the evaluation? Uh, well, the, the key thing here is we're really trying to show, uh, the, the, you know, we're not, we're not demonstrating theoretical results. We're, we're trying to make the case for implementing this in practice. And so we use historical data. We take uh, data from um, 2007, which I'll talk about, and develop historical scenarios based on these conflicting uh, traffic flow management programs. We perform the two, we use the two different approaches that are used in practice uh, to schedule, and we also perform an additional compression step, as I mentioned, to make sure that the baseline for comparison is as fair as possible. Uh, in the case where the precedence heuristic that we walk through, in the case where that exceeds the initial capacity, we'll increase the capacity as an input into the optimization model, and we'll evaluate some optimization-based approaches under those different capacity scenarios. Uh, so the data we used, as I said, this is an important part of it because we're really trying to make a strong case that, um, that this isn't just a theoretically we can construct scenarios. This is if you, if you replay 2007 traffic flow management programs, these inefficiencies are realized. 
So we've taken a sing single day of clear weather operations and used that as our baseline schedule, uh, which includes the travel times through these in route sectors. And then we have historical descriptions of ground delay and airspace flow programs. So we take 10 days historically where there were conflicts and are representative of, of the different types of days that have these conflicts. And that data includes the locations of the programs, the durations, the times, and the capacities. So basically, we're replaying bad days on top of a good day. If that makes sense. Uh, and all of this data is obtained from, from uh, Metron uh, uh, Flight Schedule Monitor. Metron is a software company that builds the system uh, that the FAA uses to run these programs, to operate the programs. So it's very accurate data. Question? Yeah, so, <clears throat> um, so if you think of the collaborative decision making, we're just, at this point, we're just focusing on that first step, the first allocation, and we're comparing it uh, using the amount of allocated delay. Allocated delay. Allocated delay. So we don't assume feasibility of the schedule from the airline's perspective, but then again, neither does the FAA's approach. So in, in some sense, we are just as bad in that regard. It, and so what, one of the things to talk about is how we subsequently try to improve upon that. Um, so, so the, the information that, that is obtained through the schedule monitor is the actual operations times. So what time did the flight depart, what time did the flight go through. So if we use the schedule from a bad day with the programs from the same bad day, then you probably wouldn't have to do very much because the schedule was already adjusted to compensate for the capacity. So instead, we use the schedule from a good day, which we assume has not been impacted by programs, and then we take the programs from a bad day and overlay it. So, you know, hypothet hypothetically, you can think of these things as being independent, right? The schedule is, could be any day, and the weather could happen any day. And so we're just, we're just overlaying it on a different day than what actually happened. I see, and, and by the programs, you mean that this is decided by, by, by people which programs to employ on a given day? Yes, exactly. Yeah. There, there's, there's, not there's likely a... There's not a no, there's, there's likely significant inefficiencies associated with that process as well. Um, but we're just saying, assuming they construct them in the same way, can we do better? Um, so just to give, I mean, just to give an idea, uh, th these are the, the 10 dates of traffic flow management programs that we use. So again, to drive home the fact that we are actually using real dates of historical programs. Um, and as you can see, the number of flights impacted ranges from 1,500 to just over 5,000. The number of ground delay programs ranges from two to eight. And airspace flow programs, one thing that was interesting when we looked at the historical data is it's just one or two. Uh, in 2007, when these were first implemented, they didn't use them very much. And so what this means is that the percentage of flights that have potential for conflicts that are impacted by multiple programs is actually relatively small. Right? This percentage of conflicts ranges from 4% to about 16%. And any flight that doesn't have a conflict means we don't really have any opportunity to improve. Right? If, they're, if they're operating independently, then this ration by schedule is in fact optimal. So that's kind of the space that we're playing with. And for each, each of these uh, days, we use historical capacities, and we also create um, a hypothetical capacity scenario where we further reduce the airspace capacities 
uh, what we found was that the airspace capacities in 2007 were actually quite high. So the airspace flow programs have limited impact on the flight schedules, which also means that this conflict is in fact overrepresenting the potential. Um, but we thought about it and said, well, as traffic continues to grow, you can add more airports, but the airspace is sort of fixed. And so you'd expect that the capacities relative to the number of flights would go down. And so this is sort of a hypothetical future looking scenario of if you were to keep the same programs, but look at it in maybe a future capacity uh, type setting, what would, what would the improvement look like? Question? It's, um, it, that's part of it, yeah. So, so, so one of the things that people have talked about is dynamic resectorization, which is uh, right now the airspace is fixed and there's some feeling that, that that makes it easier if you come in and you control the same airspace every day, then that gives you some comfort that you know how things are supposed to behave. But then that also has the limitation that um, if it's based off a of workload, you're essentially setting a fixed capacity for something that you potentially could create more capacity for by having it adjusted dynamically. Um, there are still limitations based off of uh, separation requirements that are not going to go away. And there are still capacity limitations based off of um, the routes that flights travel. They, they tend to travel point to point. Um, and so that creates some, some issues. But, you, but you're right. that you could, you could potentially increase capacity. I think there's discussion of a free flight we were just having a discussion of free flight, which would increase airspace capacity for that reason. Um, that, that good answer? Okay. Uh, so just to give you an idea of the kind of the approximate frontier, the only the only day from the historical days that we could actually solve this time order deviation approximation model for was 716 2007 but we've also looked at it for sort of constructed scenarios and found uh, that it doesn't quite match exactly as it does in this case but that the curve for the exponential penalty model tracks very closely you know in this case we see that the exponential penalty model tracks the tracks exactly but it isn't able to explore the lower end of the curve right whereas the time order deviation approximation model where we approximate that metric in the objective function, we can explore all the way down to the lower right end of the curve. And even here you can see that the exponential penalty is starting to step away. So there is starting to be a little bit of a gap. Uh, but as I said, in constructed scenarios we see a little bit of a gap but still tracking it very, slow, very closely. Um, and here what we're, what we're looking at just is the percentage of the delay that's unfair so these schedules are, are relatively fair to begin with, and the average flight delay. And these curves are generated by adjusting, in the case of the exponential penalty, the base of this exponent. Right? As you increase the exponent, you get a fairer schedule, but more delay as a result. So with this in mind, from this point on, we're just going to look at the exponential penalty model. Because that is computationally efficient, we can handle larger scenarios. and Here's some results. Uh, so in this table, what we have is we have those 10 dates that we're talking about. We're comparing uh, the exponential penalty model to the exemption RBS. Uh, it's, a easier, it's a more direct comparison because that the exemption RBS doesn't create capacity, so it makes it more of a direct uh, comparison. So we have the, amount, the average amount of flight delay that is assigned, assigned through this approach and how, what percentage of that is unfair. We have exponential penalty fair is we increase the exponential penalty till we get a solution that's at least as fair. At some point, for certain uh, situations, we can't get something at least as fair. So we just use the heuristic solution. Uh, and that's because, again, as I showed in that last chart, sometimes we're not able to explore that lower right end of that curve. Uh, and, but we also consider an exponential penalty approach where we use a, an exponential base just over one, but only allow it uh, each flight schedule to go 15 minutes beyond uh, the threshold. So we constrain it. So, it's, so it has the exponential penalty plus a constraint. And as, as we see, this gives us a little bit more of an efficiency reduction because we can play in that space. But overall, the average percent flight unfairness is still about the same. So 
through our 10 scenarios, which we feel like are representative, we get a 4% uh, delay reduction if we use this just as fair model, and we get a 4.5% if we say uh, each one doesn't have to be just as fair, but we can only go out to 15 minutes beyond it. Um, and also interesting is if you take that same uh, same setup we were just talking about, but now we're using the hypothetical capacities where airspace uh, capacities are reduced further, then you really start to get into these more significant conflicts. Then this percent delay reduction jumps up significantly. Then we can get an 8.8 percent 8 .8 delay reduction if we use the just as fair model and a 9.6 percent reduction if we use this 15 minute limit. Question? Distribution matters a lot. Um, so ration by schedule, if you consider an independent program, has very nice properties for the distribution of delay, too. It also mini minimizes the lexicographic assignment of delay. So the number of flights that receive the most delay is less than anything else. With, and so, so it has very nice distributional properties, uh, which means that these approaches which are similar to it also have fairly nice distributional properties. Um, uh, the nice thing about the exponential penalty model is it also has nice distributional properties because if you get something that you don't like distributionally, you can increase the base of the exponent and you're directly improving that distribution of flight delay. You're going to reduce the, the tail. Um, so it is, uh, in, in the paper we talk about it, it is another important consideration of how to set the base of the exponent is not just getting something that is overall fair, maybe more efficient, but also doesn't extend the tail. Um, the nice, and even this one, right, in this case, we know we're only going to extend the tail at most 15 minutes because essentially the baseline that we're using is the, the threshold. Um, it's a good point. Uh, so going back to estimated cost savings, uh, so as I said before, if, you know, 1% efficiency gain or delay reduction corresponds to about 10 million annual cost savings. The two different approaches we proposed were 4 and 4.5% 4 and delay reduction over this set of representative days. So if we assume you know, that that represents the opportunity for a 3 to 5% delay reduction, we're talking about 30 to 50 million in annual cost savings is kind of the magnitude that we're playing with. And the nice thing about this is, as I said kind of earlier, because we're taking in the existing programs as inputs, right, we're not, we're not creating programs differently than they are today, this can swap out and replace the approaches they have now. It's, it's essentially just an improvement on this conflict resolution approach, so there's not a huge integration cost associated with it. Um, oh, so, but this is, all looking at, this is all looking at delays on a flight-by-flight -flight basis. And as I said, there's a multi-tiered system where aircraft have to deal with connectivity. So what plane is scheduled to fly a sequence of flights? And also passengers have to deal with connectivity, misconnections, flight cancellations, rebooking. Uh, and so we'd also like to look at the system from the passenger's perspective, which is what I'm going to talk about next. So passenger-centric analysis, our goal is to measure system performance instead of through, instead of through flight delays, through passenger delays. And the motivation is from the paper by Bratu and Barnhart in 2005 that showed, based on a month of proprietary booking data, that there is this nonlinear relationship that you would expect. That as flight delays go up, passenger delays go up much faster because they miss connections, because flights tend to be canceled in that, in that type of regime. Uh, but it's difficult to perform this analysis more broadly because the data doesn't exist. Right, so the itinerary data that you would need to do this is not publicly available. The data that's provided, there is actually very good data provided uh, by the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, but it's all aggregated either monthly or quarterly. We don't know which passengers are on each individual flight. Um, so our approach is we estimate these historical passenger itineraries and use that to calculate passenger delays. Um, as I said, there's a lot of data. We have planned flight schedules, we have actual flight schedules, we have data on flight seating capacities, uh, we have aggregate passenger demand data, and we have proprietary booking data. All of these are in different formats and have different codes for everything, so there's lots of fun data cleaning and a nice big Oracle database that comes out at the end. Uh, uh, 
but we have a lot of data, which is nice. It, it, the, the US air transportation system is, is very good about collecting and maintaining data. Um, so, what, so our allocation approach is using the proprietary booking data. We train a discrete choice model of passenger utility associated with uh, different characteristics of the itinerary, such as the time of day, the day of week, the connection time, and even flight cancellations. And flight cancellations is interesting, right, because we don't predict passengers know which flights are going to be canceled, but if we're trying to estimate the historical itineraries, then airlines typically cancel flights that have fewer passengers. So in terms of estimating uh, the historical itineraries, it's, it, it looks like passengers have a disutility associated with canceled flights. So this isn't really a predictive model, but this is a good, we're going to use this to disaggregate this publicly available demand data. And how we're going to do that disaggregation is we sample uh, passenger itinerary allocations from this aggregate set of data. So we're going to sample them onto individual itineraries from this aggregate set of data just using a simple multinomial logit, right? So the expected proportion of passengers on itinerary I is just based off of the utility for itinerary I divided by um, all the alternatives. So looking at the validation of this data, uh, if you look at red is our allocation, blue is the proprietary booking data, uh, we get a more peaked distribution of load factors. Load factors is the percentage of, of seats that are full on a plane. And so we have the percentage of flights that have that percentage of seats being full. Right, percentage of flights on the y-axis and the percentage of, of uh, seats full is on the x-axis. So we get a slightly more peaked. Uh, we believe that's, that has to do with revenue management. It's, it's hard to tease out some of those effects, but revenue management has the effect of sort of de-peaking um, the load factor distribution uh, because they, as it gets to be uh, high, then they'll increase flights, so it, it starts to spread out a little bit more, increase prices. Uh, we do get a similar distribution of connecting passengers with a few more on the far right tail. Um, uh, connection times is particularly important because we're rebooking these passengers that miss connections. And so we get a very good match to the connection time distributions for one-stop passengers. And here's just the data of, in the booking data, there are 7.3 million passengers. From our choice allocation, we get 7.33. So it's a little bit higher. The number of passengers who miss connections is 80,000 in the booking data, 77,000 cancel, 114, 118. And then the estimated delays using a reaccommodation process, again, we get a, a pretty, we're a little bit higher, but we get a, we're about 3% higher, but we get a similar distribution across delays associated with flight delays, delays associated with misconnections, and delays associated with flight cancellations and rebookings. Um, so we feel like this, this, uh, estimated data set then provides a good input into subsequent evaluation techniques. And specifically, we look at estimating the passenger delays for 2007 for that next door report I talked about at the beginning, and we estimated that there were 247 million hours of passenger delays which, uh, to schedule, which had $9.3 billion in time lost. Uh, an average delay of 30 minutes per passenger, which compares to about an average delay of 16 minutes per flight. So it's, it is almost double. Um, and if you're disrupted, if you miss your connection or you're canceled, it's an average delay of about seven and a half hours. Uh, don't miss a connection. Um, uh, and a good rule of thumb, just in aggregate, is that about half of the delays are due to just proportionally from the flight delays, the passengers on those flights. Uh, a third of it are due to flight cancellations, and a sixth due to missed connections. It's kind of how our system seems to operate in aggregate. Uh, another kind of fun thing we can do with the data is we looked at delays for one-stop passengers in January 2007 based off of their uh, stop. And um, as might be expected, uh, my wife's rule of thumb, which is never to fly through ORD in the winter, is a pretty good rule of thumb. <laughs> Eight, uh, on average, 80 minutes of delay. Now, most of that comes from, from these disruptions, right? 40% of that average is due to people who are canceled and rebooked, and 39% is people who missed connections and re were rebooked. Uh, but uh, still, we'd say don't fly through already. If you're flying directly there, it's probably okay, but flying through there. Newark is also particularly bad. 
Um, though there were some interesting things, like Dallas-Fort Worth was particularly bad, whereas um, Houston was quite good. Uh, it's not entirely clear why that is. I think part of it is the fact that Dallas-Fort Worth is largely American traffic, which is coming from ORD. And so there's some impacts of network effects that are occurring in this, right, because we're looking at the data, um, whereas Houston is continental, and that's their major hub. So they're uh, likely flying a much cleaner network. Um, uh, but And then the other thing that we can do with this is use this in kind of this unifying framework so that we can look at traffic flow management in a multi-tiered setting. And that's, that's really the primary goal that we, we set out for. So using the exponential penalty model, we can allocate capacity to airlines. We can estimate airline disruption responses by having them attempt to minimize passenger delays. Now that we know how many passengers are on each itinerary and each flight, we can use passenger delays as a proxy for airline operating costs. We don't know exactly how their crews are scheduled. We don't know exactly how, their, um, how they make their aircraft decisions, but we can use passenger delays as a proxy. And, and in doing so, maintain aircraft fleet balance by type. And then, once we've had the airlines respond, we can measure how passenger delays propagate through that subsequent schedule. Right, so now, we've at least considered each of these tiers. We've considered the FAA's assignment, we've considered the airlines, and we've considered the passengers. And this allows us to look at things like increasing coordination. Right? If, if if, we, if the FAA incorporates some of the airline's constraints into their original allocation, how much can we improve the efficiency of the end-to-end -end multi tiered system without any new capacity? It's an interesting question, right? And uh, so we're looking at different ways of doing that, either strictly maintaining connectivity or looking at flow balance by type, uh, by aircraft and airline. And then increasing delay costs for large aircraft, this gets to the point uh, that we talked about earlier, which is, is it really a good thing for the system to be treating all planes sizes the same? And, and the answer is no, right? It's, it's, a, it's a sort of a perverse uh, incentive. And so, so we want to see if we reduce that incentive, how much does that improve the situation for passengers without even thinking about how that changes how airlines respond? Um, so in summary, we talked about a metric for balancing, uh, for measuring equity in this sort of multi-resource network setting, show that an exponential penalty model uh, for delay cost effectively balances equity and efficiency, provide an approach for estimating historical passenger itinerary flows to evaluate uh, the impacts of passenger delays in this, in this complex system, and showed how we would tie that all together in the thesis that I'm hopefully completing soon. Uh, and uh, that's about it. Yes, question. Um, yeah, so I think there's, so, so, so one thing that I think is a gap between the academic community and practice is uh, in the game theory setting, we tend to think about what is, um, uh, what is the approach that, that, that has the ideal properties. Right. Congestion pricing gives you sort of the ideal responses, and so does slot auctions. Um, but we found that in practice, those are politically untenable. So I think there is some interesting creativity that can be applied in terms of thinking about the political ramifications and how can we come up with smaller changes that may not give us all of the benefit, but have a higher likelihood of actually being implemented. So, for instance, one thing that, that someone was talking about, I mean, we talked about the landing fees. So what if you just restructure the landing fees? You make it the same pool of money, but you restructure those so that that adjusts the incentives at least a bit. How much of that does that, how much of the overall benefit does that give us uh, versus um, 
a theoretically optimal approach. Um, so I think, I think there are some interesting questions there. I think there's also some, um, some interesting questions around coordination between airlines. That how do, you, um, how do you make it so airlines can best coordinate and use the system resources most effectively? And we were talking about uh, some of that earlier. Uh, so those are, those are a couple. But, but um, yeah, coordinated system resources. Even, even one thing that I thought about is passenger seat exchanges. When there's these really bad days of disruptions, airlines tend to rebook passengers on multi-stop itineraries. And so each one of those flights is using up a seat. Now, it may be that another airline can book directly on a single seat. But right now, there's not a good way for airlines to really share that. Airlines will try to book you on their own flights first, and then only as a last resort, put you on another carrier. Uh, so if you had more of a, uh, an exchange-based system where seats could be exchanged, then you might be able to get some efficiencies on some of these really bad days, some efficiency gains on these bad days. Other questions? Thanks.